Participation. Participation was the name of the Canadian government program designed to encourage Canadians to get and stay physically fit. Created in 1971 by the federal government, Participation was successful in encouraging Canadians to be active and to stay healthy. Participation was created by the Canadian Liberal government of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Trudeau believed that sport and recreation should play an important role in the lives of Canadian citizens. His government took two steps towards the accomplishment of this goal. First, a government agency was created to provide funds for high-performance athletes, such as those training and competing in the Olympic Games. A second agency was created to encourage participation and physical activity in the general Canadian population. It was out of this second agency that participation was born. Participation became famous in the 1970s because of a series of television commercials. In these commercials, a young Canadian in his 20s was seen being outrun by a 60-year-old Swedish man. The message was that Canadians had become lazy and inactive. This was probably true of Canadians at the time. Physical fitness was not highly encouraged in schools, especially for women. Also, the government played little role in encouraging physical activity before participation. The result of participation was impressive. Canadians became more active in the years following the program's inception. Also, fitness and activity were encouraged through physical education programs. Participation was seen as a positive program because it got Canadians active while reducing healthcare costs caused by inactivity and poor physical conditioning. Recently, participation was terminated by the federal government because of a lack of funding. Many people thought this was a shame, given the positive messages the program gave to otherwise inactive Canadians. Despite the program's termination, participation has made a long-lasting impression on Canadians. Hopefully, its positive example of physical fitness for Canadians will continue in the future. The Olympic Games. The modern Olympic Games began in the late 19th century as a revival of the ancient Greek Olympics. Now, just over 100 years old, the modern Olympic movement is the biggest and most important sports movement in the world. In fact, many people believe the Olympic Games to be the most important cultural event of any kind in the world. The modern Olympic Games were the brainchild of Frenchman Baron Pierre de Coubertin. De Coubertin's dream for an international sports event and cultural movement became a reality in 1894 at the International Athletic Congress in Paris. After the games were constituted in 1894, the first Olympic Games was held in Athens, Greece, in 1896, in recognition of the ancient Greek Olympic Games. The original purpose of the Olympic Games, in de Coubertin's mind, was to celebrate and strengthen the physical, mental, and cultural qualities of humanity. The games would blend sport with culture, tradition, and education. The philosophy of Olympism is based on the joy of physical and mental effort and the respect for universal ethical principles. De Coubertin envisioned creating a more noble and sympathetic humanity through the Olympic movement. The sports events themselves, De Coubertin modeled after the English public school sports system. He saw in upper-class English boys' sport the qualities of camaraderie, nobility, and honesty. Most importantly, however, was adherence to the rules of sport. In particular, the rule that stated sport ought to be amateur in nature. De Coubertin believed participants should never participate in sport for the purpose of making money. To do so would contradict the underlying philosophy of sport. Breaking the amateur rule in De Coubertin's time was as serious a violation as taking drugs to enhance performances in today's world of sport. Over time, the Olympics grew to be the largest international festival of any kind. Today, debates exist as to the degree to which the modern games adhere to de Coubertin's original intent. On the one hand, Olympic sport is truly international in nature, as de Coubertin would have wanted it. On the other hand, it is doubtful that de Coubertin would have admired the existence of politics, commercialism, and drug use in sport. The Olympics have become truly international. 
but perhaps at a price. There is little question that the Olympic Games hold out the possibility for fulfilling de Coubertin's original goal of sport contributing to a better, more peaceful, and understanding world. Sporting Canada. There is a long and rich history of sport participation in Canada. Many of the sports and games Canadians currently play can be traced back to the early days of Canadian history. In the 19th century, sport and games in Canada were not highly organized. Few people had the time or money for playing games. The harsher aspects of everyday life took precedence. However, around the turn of the century, several amateur sport organizations emerged. These groups attempted to organize sports competitions, set rules, and develop teams and leagues. As a result, organized competitions quickly grew in number around this period of time, especially in the 50-year period between 1870 and 1920. Some of the earliest organized sports in Canada were rifle shooting, rowing, track and field, rugby, football, skating. Cricket and golf, among others, many of these sports were imports of sporting traditions from Great Britain. This made sense given that many of the leaders of early amateur sports organizations were recent British immigrants to Canada. An example of early Canadian sport can be seen in the sport of rowing. Imported from the rowing traditions in England, rowing was one of the most famous sports in early Canadian history. Although relatively few Canadians actually rowed themselves, many participated as spectators. Rowing races between Canadian oarsmen and between Canadians and international competitors were famous events. Also, gambling or betting on the outcome of races attracted many spectators. The most famous Canadian athlete of the times was Ned Hanlon, 1855 to 1908. An oarsman, Hanlon remains to this day one of the most famous athletes in Canadian history. In fact, during his life, he was famous throughout the world. A Canadian and world champion several times over, Hanlon was a fierce competitor. However, Hanlon was also famous for his appeal to spectators. He made a regular practice of gaining a seemingly insurmountable lead over his rival, and then stopping to wave at the crowds on the shoreline. He would even slow down during a race, allowing his competition to catch up to him, only to take the win at the last moment. These exploits made Hanlon one of the first showmen in sport. He recognized the importance of the entertainment value of sport. Sport in Canada has developed rapidly since Hanlon's time. Today, Canada has a complex system of amateur sports organizations and professional leagues. In addition, in the 1960s, the federal government of Canada became directly involved in the pursuit of healthy lifestyles and sporting traditions of Canadians. Today, the government provides funds for elite amateur athletes preparing for world championships and. The Olympic Games. The athletic role models produced by these government programs are crucial to Canadians in, in general. In professional sports in Canada, Canada is a relatively young country, existing as a separate national and political entity only since 1867. As a result, its sporting traditions are relatively young as well. Most of the professional teams and leagues in Canada developed only in the last thirty years or so. However, athletes playing their respective sports for money dates back to the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Canada has six National Hockey League (NHL) teams, eight Canadian Football League (CFL) clubs, two Major League Baseball (MLB) clubs, and one National Basketball Association (NBA) team. There are also smaller professional soccer and lacrosse leagues in Canada. It is estimated that professional sports and leagues throughout the country contribute over six hundred million dollars in value to the country's economy and account for over twenty-three thousand jobs. Of the professional sports, hockey has the longest history and the greatest cultural influence on Canadians. 
The NHL has been in existence since 1917. However, organized professional and amateur leagues existed in Canada long before them. Many small town teams competed for local or provincial championships and had a strong influence on those Canadians who had little access to or knowledge of big city teams in Toronto or Montreal. In fact, it was not until NHL games were broadcast on the Canadian National Radio Hockey Night in Canada radio broadcast that many Canadians had experience an NHL game. Indeed, despite the fact that the NHL was considered Canada's most prestigious league, it was not until the advent of television in the 1950s that most Canadians had ever seen an NHL game. Today, all professional sport in Canada is one way or another affected by the more powerful American leagues. In the sports of baseball and basketball, Canada has no professional leagues of its own. Instead, Canadian teams play in the American-dominated leagues. These leagues require a large, concentrated audience in order to generate revenues for the team and, in turn, the league in general. As a result, the major team franchises exist in the large urban centers, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Even between those cities, the teams are not evenly spread. Probably the most famous teams in the American-dominated leagues are both Toronto teams, the Blue Jays in Major League Baseball and the Raptors in the National Basketball Association. Many Canadians worry that the American dominance of professional sport is a threat to Canadian independence. As an important component of national culture, sport reflects and reinforces the norms and values of Canada. However, the most sought-after and visible teams in Canada are ones in American-dominated leagues. Even the National Hockey League, once considered a secure Canadian sports icon, has its corporate offices in New York. Debates about the threat of American-dominated professional sports to Canadian sovereignty will undoubtedly continue in the future. Ned Hanlon Edward Ned Hanlon 1855 to 1908, was one of the most important athletes in Canadian history. Hanlon, an oarsman, helped shape the direction of Canadian sport in its early formative years. His combination of athletic success and popularity with rowing spectators helped promote the cause of rowing and professional sport. In the late 19th century, rowing was one of the, if not the, most popular sports in Canada. The sport received as much, if not more, press coverage and general public interest than any other sport. In addition, the sport's long history in Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and the United States developed into well-organized national and international championships, including one of the first regularly held world championships in any sport. In fact, Hanlon was a regular winner of world championship titles. Part of the popularity of rowing involved gambling and lucrative prizes. Spectators regularly bet on single sculling, in much the same way they do on horse racing today. Hanlon quickly rose to fame in the late 19th century through a combination of careful financial planning of his athletic career and his mastery of the sport. Perhaps his most ingenious invention was the now common sliding seat. By fixing wheels onto a wooden seat, Hanlon gained an advantage over his competitors who slid back and forth in the boat on Greece. The extra use of his legs translated into greater boat speed for Hanlon. Hanlon was also noteworthy for his methods of gaining popularity with fans. Recognizing the importance of the entertainment value of sport, Hanlon would regularly wave to the crowds and perform rowing tricks such as removing his hands from the oars in the middle of the race. He was even known to fake an injury in the middle of a race, only to recover just in time to win the race. Of course, the additional purpose of this strategy was to raise gambling odds, thus making himself and his financial handlers wealthier from his victories. In the 1870s and 1880s, Hanlon won and then successfully defended his world championship title seven times. He also competed in commercial exhibitions and rowing tours around the world. After his competitive career ended, Hanlon went on to coach younger oarsmen in two North American universities, Toronto and Columbia. So famous was Hanlon that one major newspaper in Canada claimed he was the single greatest agent for attracting new immigrants to the young country. Today, a bronze statue stands in Toronto in honor of his success, and an island just off the shores of the city of Toronto is named after Hanlon. Rowing 
The sport of rowing is one of the oldest organized sports in the Western world. The modern version of the sport was developed mainly in England in the 19th century, especially in the public school system. However, boat races somewhat similar to the modern sport took place in ancient Greece during the ancient version of the Olympics. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, rowing gained much popularity. The sport was particularly famous in countries with a history of immigration from Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and the United States of America. Most of the main colonial countries had national championships, and a world championship was regularly held. The sport developed either in private clubs or in elite educational institutions. In 1852, a race between Yale and Harvard universities in the U.S. was the first organized athletic competition of any kind. The turn of the century saw the sport's ascendancy to one of the largest spectator sports. Many regularly held races depended on betting or gambling to attract spectators. The biggest international matches attracted thousands of spectators, and much money was wagered. Canadian Ned Hanlon was perhaps the greatest of the early rowing champions. In the late 19th century, he dominated international rowing races. Hanlon also combined his rowing skill and prowess with his own unique brand of showmanship to attract spectators. Hanlon is also known for having invented the sliding seat. His wooden seat, set on wheels, greatly increased his efficiency and speed, and gave him a distinct advantage over competitors. Before Hanlon's time, rowers would wipe grease on a wooden platform in the boat and slide over the grease. The older technique was less reliable and did not allow as much leg drive as Hanlon's newly invented seat. As the 20th century unfolded, rowing lost some of its earlier public support and distinction. In North America, as professional sports attracted the attention of spectators and television viewers, other amateur sporting traditions such as rowing lost support. Today, rowing maintains a strong tradition under the administration of the world governing body for the sport. However, the yearly world championship does not typically receive the attention of other major sports events such as track and field. The highlight of rowing competition is undoubtedly the Olympic Games. However, older traditional races such as the English Henley and the yearly Oxford Cambridge boat race still attract large crowds. A more recent development in rowing is recreational and masters rowing. In an attempt to regain popularity in the sport, many clubs in North America are offering less competitive recreational programs. And encouraging older masters rowers to participate. This is probably a positive move, and at least two reasons. One is that the sport will attract many more participants. However, the other equally important reason is that the sport might dispense some of the elitist image many people have of the sport as an English old boy sport. Tiger Woods. One of the most dramatic moments in golf occurred on April thirteenth, nineteen ninety-seven. On that day, Eldrick Tiger Woods, at the young age of twenty-one, won the prestigious Masters Golf Tournament. Not only was Woods the youngest ever to perform the feat, Woods's score of two hundred and seventy set a record for the tournament. His victory was also seen by many as a symbolic victory over years of racism in the sport of golf and U.S. society in general. Woods's victory in 1997 came just two days after the 50th anniversary of the day American baseball players broke the color barrier in professional baseball. Also, Woods's victory came in a sport long recognized for racial exclusion. The Augusta National Golf Club excluded blacks from playing in the Masters tournament until 1975, and the Professional Golfers Association only removed its Caucasians only rule in 1961. Woods was born in the state of Florida in 1975. He rose to fame quickly, winning the U.S. Amateur Tournament from 1994 to 1996, National Collegiate Athletic Association champion in 1996, and U.S. Junior Championship from 1991 to 1993. In the first year that Woods turned professional, it is estimated that over $650 million U.S. in extra revenue was generated in golf. Television ratings soared in the sport, and the Professional Golfers Association negotiated huge contracts with American television networks as a result of Woods's fame. Woods has also negotiated record-breaking private sponsorship deals with major firms such as Nike, Buick, Titleist, 
American Express, and many others. In fact, Woods negotiated deals in the millions even before he turned professional. Truly an international sports celebrity, Woods sees himself as someone destined not only to be a great athlete, but also a person who will have some significant social or political impact on the world. It is not clear, however, what that impact will be. But there is little question that he will be one of the, if not the, richest athletes in history. Woods is destined not just to be a multi-millionaire, but a billionaire. Heralded by some as the first black champion in a traditionally racially secluded sport, he has also been received more cautiously by those who see the limitations of using black sports stars as role models for youth. Only a tiny fraction of African Americans have even the remote chance of becoming sports stars in any sport, especially golf. The odds, in fact, are so small that there is a much greater chance of winning a lottery. However, by some accounts, as many as 80% of African American youth aspire to make a living from playing sports. Meanwhile, 45% of African American children live below the poverty line in the U.S. If the trajectory of Woods' career continue on its current path, it is possible he will satisfy his father's wishes for Tiger to make an impact on the world. It will be spiritual and humanitarian, and it will transcend the world of golf. Globalization and Sport One of the most recognized and widely debated terms in recent times is globalization. While there is little consensus as to what it actually is, there is little doubt that the world has in one way or another become more interconnected. Mass communications and transportation technology, in addition to the rise of transnational corporate culture, have combined to produce a new global culture. At the same time, sport has become one of the most recognized elements of global culture. In fact, it has been claimed that there are no other events in the world that attract the attention of more people around the world than sports events, especially the Olympic Games and the World Cup football soccer tournament. It is difficult to think of other events that attract the world's attention in the same manner as sport. Global themes infuse international sporting events in several ways. One of those ways is in advertising. Major transnational corporations using major events like the Olympic Games advertise with global themes and images. In addition, media coverage of major events often emphasizes national and international themes. These themes can be both positive and negative. For example, sport can reinforce international cooperation and cultural learning, but it can also be used to reinforce themes of aggressive nationalism and create tension between countries. This was clearly the case during the Cold War from World War II to the late 1980s, in which West Bloc and East Bloc nations regularly did battle at the Olympic Games. More recently, additional global themes have appeared. The international immigration and movement of athletes is one theme. Increasingly, professional and elite amateur athletes are attracted to other. Football, soccer, is one sport that practices athlete immigration frequently. Many professional teams in Europe, for example, have many players from outside the team's nation. An additional global theme that has appeared lately is sport used for international advertising and marketing. Sport provides a very useful device for transnational marketing and advertising because the symbols provided by sport are often recognizable internationally, and sport provides many of the themes and images important to advertising. Speed, strength, competition, perseverance, and so forth. Many corporations such as IBM and Coca-Cola regularly use sport to advertise their products, even though these corporations don't sell sport-related products directly. Some critics have claimed that major international events such as the Olympic Games are being used less for international understanding and cultural sharing as they are for making big corporations a lot of money. While it is clear that the sport-related images and symbols used by these corporations are recognized worldwide, it is not so clear what positive benefits are accrued from this. In any case, there is little doubt that sport will continue to play a vital role in the globalization process. Women in Sport The struggle to attain equality for female participation in sport has been a long and hard-fought one. One hundred years ago, a majority of people, many women included, 
would have thought it unnatural, if not immoral, to permit women to participate in sports. Today, women's participation is widespread and accepted by most. However, there are still many sports and sport-related institutions and organizations that have not achieved full equality. Some sports, such as football or boxing, encourage very little female participation. Although even these so-called masculine sports are changing, women's boxing, for example, will probably be included in the Olympic Games by the end of this decade. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, when sports and physical education programs were first organized in North America, women were forbidden from participating for so-called scientific or medical reasons. Physicians, as a group, often spoke out against female athleticism, using the argument that physical activity would damage reproduction. Others claimed that it was quite simply unnatural for women to participate in sports. Little real evidence was provided to support these claims. In truth, the so-called evidence was more a reflection of physicians' cultural assumptions about women's place in society in general. The 1920s and 1930s witnessed a short golden age in women's sports. Individual athletes and teams or leagues formed to support female athletics. Track and field, tennis, softball, programs in physical education, and other activities were encouraged, at least for those women lucky enough to have the time and money to participate. There was even a women's Olympic Games movement in the 1920s and 1930s. At one point, the regular Olympic Games organized by the International Olympic Committee (IOC) became concerned that the women's Olympics would gain enough power to challenge the superiority of the IOC's Olympics. As a result, the IOC included a few more women's events in their games, although not many. The golden age of women's sports was followed by a long drought. The post World War II era was one of very conservative traditional family values in North America. However, in the 1970s, the current boom in women's sports began. One of the driving forces in the movement was East Bloc countries, particularly the Soviet Union and East Germany. Both of which encouraged female athletes at the highest level, the Olympic Games. Female athletes with strong and muscular bodies emerged on the international sports stage. At first, this raised concern among the male-dominated sports establishment. However, after years of struggle, the muscular and strong female athletic body has become common in international sport. In the late 19th century, the founder of the modern Olympic Games, Pierre de Coubertin. Said that the sight of women participating in sport was an affront to the human eye and unnatural. We've come a long way since then. Sport and television. There is little question that television has radically changed the sporting world. Television has done more than just make existing sports more accessible to a mass audience. It has argued that the very nature of sport and spectators' experiences of sport has been shaped by the medium of television. The first televised sporting event took place on May 17, 1939. A baseball game between two American schools, Princeton and Columbia, marked the beginning of a new era in sport. The first broadcast, however, was not of particularly high quality. Viewers could hardly see the players on the television screen. The technology at the time being of very low quality. In addition, very few people owned television sets at the time. Only 400 TV sets were in circulation, and the average cost of $600 made owning a set impossible for most people. This situation would soon change. Television, as a popular and affordable medium, grew rapidly in the 1940s and 1950s. By the end of the 1950s, American televised sport entered a golden age. It was during this period of time that major sporting organizations, such as professional leagues and major amateur organizations, such as the International Olympic Committee (IOC), realized the benefits of television. Not only could TV make competitions available for a huge number of spectators. It could actually make money for these organizations. Television companies, in turn, could make money by attracting viewers and selling advertising space at increased rates. Television and sport entered what some observers call a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship. The business relationship developed between the American TV company ABC and the Olympic Games is a clear example of the TV sport symbiosis. 
In the 1960s and 1970s, ABC recognized the importance of using international sport to attract viewers. By being recognized as the Olympic network, ABC quickly rose from being the third biggest commercial network in the U.S. to being the leading network. At the same time, ABC paid higher and higher rights fees to the IOC, and the IOC in turn began to take a more commercial and professional approach to the Olympic Games. The ABC role model has paved the way for other television networks around the world. Today, television rights pay for the majority of Olympic Games expenses. The television and sport relationship has come a long way since the first Princeton Columbia baseball game. Today, more people experience sport as spectators through the medium of television than they do as regular participants in sport. The television and sport relationship then presents a bit of a paradox. While on one hand it has made sport more visible for more people, it has perhaps done so at the expense of actual participation in sport. Nike. Nike and its swoosh corporate symbol are among the most recognized brand names in the world, alongside McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Disney. Starting in 1964 as a sports shoe outlet, the company grew to become the market leader in footwear and apparel. Nike has since diversified into a range of activities, including sports event promotion. Owned by Phil Knight, Nike has become synonymous with world-class sport, especially through its sponsorship of events and elite athletes such as Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. Nike is so ever-present in the sports consumers' minds that a survey conducted during the Atlanta Summer Olympic Games in 1996 revealed an extremely high awareness of Nike. Despite the fact that Nike was not an official sponsor of the games, Nike's success has, to a great extent, been due to the fact that the company and its swoosh symbol have become ubiquitous in consumers' minds. Nike has even run television commercials without even mentioning its own name, being confident enough that the checkmark swoosh is more than enough to make the company known. Phil Knight has been the main inspiration behind Nike and its corporate direction. A competent, although not elite, middle distance runner at the University of Oregon, Knight went on to Harvard Business School, where the Nike idea emerged out of a paper he developed for a class on entrepreneurship. Knight's former coach, Bill Bowerman, developed lightweight running shoes that became the new company's trademark in the early days. From these modest beginnings, Nike eventually grew to become the sports giant it is today. Ironically, part of Nike's status in the world of competitive sports merchandising has come from the attention it's received by critics. A short article published in the early 1990s in Harper's Magazine quickly mushroomed into an international outcry against Nike's practice of placing their factories in underdeveloped countries and paying workers below subsistence wages. Nike quickly responded to the criticisms with a number of tactics to either divert attention away from the criticisms, ones that Knight interestingly at first denied, or by acknowledging the practices but claiming Nike was cleaning up its act. In many cases, Nike has made an effort to create better working conditions for those in underdeveloped countries making shoes and other merchandise. However, the overall effect of Nike's changes is not known, and several groups around the world regularly check and often criticize Nike's labor practices. Nike's recent marketing extravaganzas include a $200 million U.S. deal with the Brazilian National Soccer Federation. It has been rumored that Nike's ego has much to do with Nike's marketing strategies. Some critics have suggested that Nike's hidden agenda is no less than controlling sports marketing and merchandising throughout the world. Nike's corporate headquarters in Oregon reflect these aspirations. Nike's buildings and surrounding grounds are constructed very much like a religious cathedral, only with elite athletes and Knight himself as the gods. Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe, 1943 to 1993, was one of the most exceptional tennis players in the history of the sport. Born in Richmond, Virginia, Ashe served in the United States Army and had a good early amateur career. By the end of his life in 1993, Ashe was recognized not only for his tennis but also for his political campaigns on behalf of racial equality in the United States, Haiti, and South Africa. Also, as a victim of AIDS, Ash campaigned for AIDS research near the end of his life. 
When Ash turned professional in 1969, he was an African-American player in a sport completely dominated by whites. At the peak of his career in the 1970s, Ash won the Australian Open, Wimbledon, and doubles titles at the French and Australian Opens. Interestingly, Ash encouraged young blacks not to waste their energies on sports. Instead, he recommended channeling energy into academic and vocation-related studies. His recommendation seems appropriate to this day. While it is the case that sports can provide positive role models and encourage hard work and discipline, it is also the case that many young athletes dream unrealistically of professional careers at the exclusion of school. The odds of successfully making a professional league are statistically next to impossible. Despite his own success, Ash recognized this. Mindful of racism in American society, Ash always thought of his own career in terms of the general experience of blacks in America. He wrote several books recounting these ideas. Ash's historical writing on the history of African Americans in sport spawned a multimedia series, A Hard Road to Glory. Today, while a few more blacks have been successful in sports traditionally dominated by whites, it is still the case that whites dominate. The recent successes of athletes like the Williams sisters in tennis and Tiger Woods in golf sometimes conceal the fact that these sports are still predominantly white. According to Ash's thinking, it would be a mistake to take one role model such as Tiger Woods and from that conclude that race problems in sport no longer exist. Like any institution, race relations and sport should be thought of for their long-term trends, not individual exceptions. Arthur Ashe contracted the HIV virus through a blood transfusion and died of AIDS in 1993, aged 50. Well, since his death, he has become revered and respected. In the 1980s, near the end of his life, he was unpopular for his ideas. However, his combination of political campaigning and athletic prowess made him a revered figure in American history. Bjorn Borg The professional career of tennis player Bjorn Borg was one of the most interesting ones in recent sports history. Borg's success in his sport came at an early age. Borg won Wimbledon when he was only 20 years old. However, by the time he was 26 and in the prime of his career, Borg inexplicably retired from professional tennis. Borg, who began playing tennis at the age of nine, was the number one ranked junior player by the age of 14 and had won the Italian and French Open titles at the age of 18. These were the first of several major championships won by Borg in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Probably his greatest achievement was a winning streak at Wimbledon that spanned five years. Between the years 1976 and 1982, Borg enjoyed almost complete dominance in competitive tennis. His retirement in 1983, then, was a bit of a puzzle. Although his tennis skills waned somewhat in the previous year, he was still one of the top players on the tour and only 26 years old. Even stranger was the fact that Borg refused to reveal the reasons for his retirement. Following his retirement, Borg encountered a number of personal problems, which kept him in the media spotlight, even though he was no longer playing competitive tennis. Five years after his retirement, an emergency hospital procedure saved his life. While Borg claimed he had food poisoning, it was suspected he had a barbiturate overdose. In 1991, Borg attempted to make a comeback on the professional tennis tour, only to fail miserably. His insistence on using a wooden racket at the time, when all of the world's top players were using synthetic fiber rackets, didn't help matters. At the same time, Borg's second wife attempted to commit suicide, and the couple divorced in 1993. Eventually, Borg disappeared into obscurity, and there is little news of his life today. These sad stories about the latter part of his career aside, Borg was an important figure in modern tennis history. He was the sport's first modern media star and icon. Teenage girls conferred upon him a status comparable to a rock star. His face adorned t-shirts and other merchandise, making him the most marketable tennis player in history. Borg's career was a catalyst for Swedish tennis players. Those who followed in his footsteps and held him up as their hero included tennis stars Mats Wielander and Stefan Edberg. Perhaps most important of all, 
Borg gave to the sport of tennis a degree of showmanship, visibility, and marketability that was used as a role model for the sport in future decades. Babe Didrikson Mildred Babe Didrikson, 1913 to 1956, was one of the most celebrated female athletes of the first half of the 20th century. Competing in the 1930s and 1940s when conventional attitudes regarding women's participation in sport dominated North American culture, Babe Didrikson rose to fame by dominating not just one, but a number of sports. Didrikson flouted conventional notions of femininity and proper female activity by excelling in field events such as javelin and shot put, in addition to traditionally male-dominated sports such as baseball, swimming, and golf. Interestingly, Didrikson would always have to battle popular accounts that attacked or questioned her femininity and sexuality. As a woman with a large, muscular, and athletic body, Didrikson was often accused of having an unfair advantage over other women, and often regarded as not being a real woman. Born in the state of Texas, Didrikson rose to athletic fame quickly, representing the USA in the 1932 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, where she won and set records in the javelin and 80-meter hurdles. Later in her career, Didrikson turned her athletic attention mainly to golf, a sport in which she was immensely successful. Interestingly, however, Didrik seemed tired of the popular innuendo regarding her unfeminine appearance and made a conscious effort to change her image in favor of a more traditionally feminine one. She donned dresses and makeup in place of her sweatpants and makeup-less appearance. Didrikson's controversial career underwent a twist when she fought the American Athletic Union, AAU, which had stripped her of her amateur sports status after she allowed her image to be used in endorsements for cars. When offered amateur status reinstatement, Didrikson refused, challenging what she believed to be the AAU's antiquated rules and regulations. Aside from her incredible athletic accomplishments, Didrikson is an important historical figure because of the challenge she made to the male-dominated institution of sport. Didrikson challenged those within the institution of sport to question gender values at a time when the political environment made it difficult to do so. Didrikson prefigured by several decades the challenges to sport made by other female athletes, such as Billie Jean King, Martine Navratilova, and Florence Griffith Joyner. Didrikson forced a re-examination of the meaning of sports, making many aware of the social and political importance of an institution typically not thought of as such. The Dubbin Inquiry The Dubbin Inquiry was a Canadian federal government inquiry into the state of amateur sport in Canada, more specifically into the use of performance-enhancing drugs by Canadian athletes. The inquiry followed in the footsteps of Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson's disqualification in the 1988 Seoul Olympics. The inquiry was named after Charles Dubbin, a Canadian judge who presided over the proceedings. Johnson won the Olympic men's 100-meter final in a world record time of 9.79 seconds. However, his post-race mandatory drug test was positive. Johnson was found to have taken the steroids to Nozolol. The subsequent stripping of Johnson's gold medal turned into probably the most famous case of drug use in the history of sports. It also sent shock waves rippling through the Canadian sports establishment with various members of government and the sport bureaucracy pointing fingers at each other. Many observers of the sports establishment around the world followed the Dubbin Inquiry and the Johnson case. Several countries were dealing with a growing problem of their own athletes using drugs to enhance performance, so the results of the inquiry were eagerly anticipated. The inquiry heard testimony from a large number of athletes, coaches, sports administrators, and others. The most interesting submissions were made by Johnson's coach, Charlie Francis, his physician, Jamie Astefan, and of course, from John. Johnson himself. The inquiry disclosed drug taking on a scale never before suspected. It was discovered that, besides the common practice of coaches encouraging athletes to take drugs, many others were guilty of turning a blind eye to the problem and ignoring it. In the aftermath of the inquiry, a new organization, the Canadian Centre for Drug-Free Sport, was created to combat the problem. This organization has taken various measures in its attempt to combat drug use by Canadian athletes. 
However, critics of the Dublin Inquiry have accused the Inquiry of being little more than a government inquisition, the real purpose of which was to direct attention towards individual athletes and coaches and away from the government itself. Increasingly, in the 1980s, Sport Canada, the governing body responsible for the administration of elite amateur sport in Canada, had taken a success-oriented approach to Canadian sport, emphasizing winning medals above all other goals. The result, critics have pointed out, was to put immense pressure on Canadian athletes, leading in turn to drug use, among many other extreme measures, to enhance performance. The Dublin Inquiry, in other words, has had mixed reviews. A further indication of the effectiveness of the Dublin Inquiry can be seen in the state of Canadian sports since the Inquiry. Despite attempts by the Canadian Centre for Drug-Free Sport to educate athletes and coaches on the dangers of drug use, there is little doubt that rampant drug use continues. This has led some observers of the Canadian sports scene to claim that drug use is less a reflection of individual athletes who cheat, but more a reflection of a cultural and institutional epidemic in sport. Drug use has perhaps become so common in the culture of elite sport that dealing with a problem by punishing individual athletes might be ineffective. FIFA Created in 1904 with seven member nations, FIFA, Fédération Internationale de Football Association, is the international governing body of soccer. Soccer is the most widely watched and played game in the world. FIFA organizes the World Cup, which takes place every four years. In many ways, the development of FIFA follows the organization of the sport of football, soccer itself. At the start of the 20th century, it was primitive in its organization and loosely structured. However, by the end of the century, FIFA had affiliations in all six continents with over 170 member countries. Alongside the International Olympic Committee, FIFA is the largest sports organization in the world. At the time of FIFA's creation, soccer had gained a following in several countries, in large part due to British settlements. It was not until 1863 that the sports of soccer and rugby were formally separated in England. While both sports were important in British culture in the 19th century, it was soccer that took off around the world at a much more accelerated rate. As the 20th century progressed, countries like Holland, Germany, Spain, Brazil, and many others became as good as, and in many cases better at the game than, the founding country. The World Cup began in 1930 in Uruguay. By then, FIFA had attained enough power and the game was so widespread that a world championship was justified. By the time the 1998 World Cup was staged in France, 112 countries competed. Despite the sport originating in England, that country did not win a World Cup until 1966. One notable exception to the soccer fanaticism that is seen in many countries around the world is the USA. There has always been a problem developing soccer in the country that dominates so many other professional and amateur sports. One of the main reasons for this is the country is inundated with its professional sports system. For one reason or another, the USA has opted for sports traditionally played in relatively few countries, American-style football, basketball, and what many consider to be the quintessential American sport, baseball. There is also the problem soccer presents for American television networks. Successful sports in the USA have usually been ones appropriate for commercial television. Soccer, with its two 45-minute halves and long, uninterrupted play, is less than ideal for commercials and advertising-based American television. The most recent evolution in soccer has been in the women's game. The 1999 Women's World Cup held in the USA was an unqualified success. Indeed, FIFA's president proclaimed that the future of football is female. International Olympic Committee the International Olympic Committee, IOC, was formed in 1896 to govern the organization and development of what were understood to be a modern version of the Greek Olympic Games. Its first president was Dimitros Vikalis, a Greek, and its secretary was Frenchman Pierre de Coubertin. De Coubertin's energy and his vision have been the true inspiration behind the modern Olympic movement. The IOC has effectively governed the Olympic movement for over 100 years. However, that period of time has seen many conflicts and controversies within the IOC and in the Olympic movement as a whole. 
At first, the main obstacle that Kubert's hand faced to creating an international Olympic movement was the lack of organization of sport internationally. Early sports organizations, most of them amateur, had trouble organizing their own sports and leagues nationally. As a result, cooperating with the IOC internationally was an extreme challenge. In the early years, de Coubertin's own vision for the games dictated much of the IOC's policies and procedures. His prejudices also influenced the movement. For example, de Coubertin was adamant in his rejection of female athletes' participation in the games. An embodiment of Victorian ideals and prejudices, de Coubertin thought women's place was in the home and bearing and raising children. Indeed, he thought of women's competition as unnatural, immoral, and indecent. As a result of de Coubertin's powerful position within the IOC, it would take many years to have women participating in any significant way. The IOC has always claimed a hands-off approach to political struggles and controversies surrounding the Games, claiming, now for over 100 years, that the IOC is not a political organization and that the sport in its purest sense, one represented best by the IOC, of course, is inherently non-political. The IOC has always had trouble answering critics who point out obvious exceptions to the claim. At the simplest level, the act of competing under national flags, something the IOC encourages, is a political event. At a higher political level, the Olympic Games have been used for political demonstrations through boycotts, and the Olympic movement was probably the most visible means of symbolically fighting the Cold War. The post-World War II years were lean ones for the Olympic movement. The IOC and hosting cities and nations often had trouble breaking even. At its worst, the Games went into great financial debt, most notoriously in the Summer Games in Montreal in 1976. However, since that time, the Games have taken a more market-friendly approach, encouraging private sponsorship and negotiating massive television contracts with networks around the world, especially those in the USA. As a result, the IOC is a much more financially solvent organization than it was a few decades ago. However, it is not clear that the IOC is following its founder's original plan for the movement. After all, de Coubertin was a pure amateur at heart. The current, commercially-oriented Olympics would make de Coubertin concerned, to say the least. Irvin Magic Johnson Irvin Magic Johnson is recognized as one of the best basketball players in the history of the sport. He will also be remembered as the first sports performer of international stature to declare openly that he had contracted the HIV virus. Magic Johnson was born in the state of Michigan and quickly rose to fame in the state by becoming an outstanding player for Michigan State. At six foot nine inches, Magic was a formidable player. An enthusiastic sports reporter gave Magic the nickname to him during his high school years. During his college years, he developed a rivalry with another future National Basketball Association NBA superstar, Larry Bird, then playing for the Indiana State basketball team. Their rivalry will become one of the main forces to generate interest in the NBA in the early 1980s. During his playing days in the NBA from 1979 to 1991, Johnson was named the league's most valuable player three times. He also became attractive to commercial advertisers during a period when it had become less taboo to use African-American athletes to endorse products. Johnson, however, was always guarded about his comments regarding racial issues. However, he was active in charity work and, in general, maintained a very positive light in the public's eye throughout his career. On announcing his retirement, Johnson stated that he had contracted the HIV virus from unprotected heterosexual sex. However, tales and rumors circulated in the press and in popular discourse about Johnson's sexual exploits during his days as an NBA superstar. Ironically, Johnson, upon retirement, became a spokesperson for safe sex. Another famous sports star, tennis player Martina Navratilova, criticized Johnson and pointed out that if the same comments had been made publicly by a female, she would have been labeled a slut. Navratilova probably made a good point. Not only was Johnson's public image a positive one, but also he was actively seen as a role model for heterosexual family life. 
The events and controversies surrounding Johnson's retirement probably raised his status as an athlete in the public eye, making his career that much more notable. There is little question, then, that the combination of incredible athletic prowess and the events surrounding his retirement will bestow among Magic Johnson a prestigious position in sports history. Michael Jordan Michael Jordan is one of the most recognized sports figures in the world. To understand the breadth of his fame, it's probably best to think of Jordan in two senses, as a person and an athlete with incredible athletic prowess and skill, and as a cultural and media icon. The second way of thinking about Jordan is probably equal to the first. After all, it was his endorsement of dozens of commercial products, spots and movies, and in general, his commercially and market-produced image that made Jordan so famous worldwide. Jordan was born in 1963, one of three sons of a corporate executive. He attended North Carolina University from 1981 to 84 and was then drafted to the National Basketball Association's NBA Chicago Bulls. During the same year, he co-captained the USA basketball team to gold in the 1984 Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Jordan's fame was quickly accelerated with the help of his agent at a marketing firm. After winning the NBA's Rookie of the Year distinction, Jordan quickly began signing a series of marketing contracts that would eventually create the iconic image known throughout the world. The most notable marketing endorsement contract came with Nike Corporation. Nike built much of its marketing and commercial strategy around Jordan in the 1980s and early 1990s. With his own line of Nike-produced basketball shoes and clothing, Jordan established himself as a marketable commodity. The relationship between Nike and Jordan would be a mutually beneficial one. It elevated Jordan to international prominence while helping push Nike to number one status as world sports merchandisers. Jordan's athletic status was also aided by the fact that his was a career with relatively little controversy, unlike many other superstar athletes. Social and political controversies surrounding Jordan were rare, and when they did occur, these were minor. In 1992, he got himself into a bit of trouble when he did not allow his image to be used by the NBA for the licensing of leisure wear and memorabilia in the run-up to the Summer Olympic Games. In addition, once at the Games, Jordan, being contractually committed to Nike, refused to wear the official sponsor Reebok's warm-up suits. The issue was resolved when Jordan and his teammates wore the U.S. flag and extra-long lapels to cover the Reebok logo. In 1993, Jordan made a surprise announcement of his retirement from the NBA at the age of 30. He signed as a free agent to play Major League Baseball with the Chicago White Sox and played unsuccessfully, as it turned out, with the White Sox minor league affiliate. Jordan then made a brief comeback in the NBA, only to retire soon after. History will recognize Jordan not only for his athletic prowess, arguably the best the sport of basketball has ever seen, and for his iconic status in the later 20th century world of sports marketing and image production. Billie Jean King during her competitive days, Billie Jean King was one of the most successful players in women's tennis. However, King is probably more recognized for her political support of women's tennis and her fight to achieve respect for lesbian and gay athletes in tennis and in sport in general. Born in Long Beach, California in 1943 as Billie Jean Moffat, she began playing tennis at the age of 11. King learned the game playing on municipal courts rather than the route most successful players take in tennis in the private clubs. When King began competing in the elite levels of tennis, the sport was strictly amateur. She first entered Wimbledon in 1961, and only two years later, she advanced to the final. She won her first Wimbledon title in 1966 at the young age of 22. Her first place prize for winning was a $60 gift voucher for Harrods Department Store. By the end of her remarkable career, King would amass a remarkable 39 Grand Slam titles. Although women's tennis was amateur, King and a few other players began arguing for professional status. Indeed, King's competitive performances and training regimen took on a very professional tone. In fact, it was King and not men's player John McEnroe who started the practice of arguing against umpires' decisions on the court. 
although it's the latter player who is better known for such antics. King's training and competitive practices made her a truly modern and professional player, but they also cost her much public support. King's major initiative was to start a professional tour, which began in 1968, operating outside the auspices of the official tournaments and organizations, the new professional tour had trouble attracting many of the top international players. Interestingly, Wimbledon allowed professionals soon after King's Tour started. The rest of the world's tours permitted professionals soon after. Among King's other major political initiatives, she aligned herself with the pro-abortion movement, titled IX Legislation in the U.S., the purpose of which was to equalize girls' and women's funding and education. And she negotiated a deal with the Philip Morris Tobacco Company to set up the Virginia Slims Tour. Finally, the famous match between herself and self-styled male chauvinist pig Bobby Riggs in 1973, which King won, brought much public attention to King and to the growing women's athletic movement. Movement. Finally, in 1981, it was revealed that King had a lesbian relationship with her secretary. At first, King denied the allegation, but later she admitted to the relationship. Instead of hiding her sexuality, which is what female lesbian athletes have been doing for years, King was the first major sports superstar to come out. As such, King will be justifiably recognized as one of the first and most important fighters for the sexual rights of gays and lesbians in sport. Marathon Few sports events integrate the competitive side of sport with the social and playful side of sport like marathon running. This might seem like a strange thing to say about what is such a rigorous and physically challenging event. However, major city marathons attract both serious competitors and less serious runners in the same event and often generate a citywide party atmosphere leading up to and during the event. The competitive marathon was introduced as part of the modern Olympic Games in 1896. The purpose of the event was to mimic the ancient Greek Games, despite the fact that no such event was held in ancient Greece. However, according to legend, in 490 BC, a Greek soldier ran from Marathon to Athens to take news of a Greek military victory over the Persians. The runner collapsed with exhaustion and died. Interestingly, the first winner of the modern-day Olympic marathon in Athens Greece was Spyridon Luz, a Greek runner. As the 20th century unfolded, major track and field meets integrated the marathon into their schedules. However, the marathon grew in popularity due mostly to the emergence of several urban-based marathons. Some, notably the Boston Marathon, had been around for decades. However, many new ones emerged, especially in the 1970s and 1980s. The emergence of these popular races coincided with the late 20th century boom in sports and exercise industry. As a result, the sport of running took off. Also, lasting images from top international competitions began to attract people to marathon running. In the Olympic marathon in 1952, Emil Zatopek won the race after having competed and also won in the 5,000 and 10,000 meter races. In 1960 and 1964, Ethiopian Abibi Bikila won the marathon, making himself a national hero. Images of Bikila running barefoot in his first victory in 1960 are ingrained in most serious marathoners' minds. Women entered marathon running in the 1960s and 1970s, although their participation was met with great resistance. While women had run marathons for decades, the first recorded time came in 1926 by Violet Percy. It was Kathy Switzer's run in the 1967 Boston Marathon that was one of the most important symbolic runs for women. In the middle of the marathon, a Boston official spotted Switzer running and tried to yank her off the course. Switzer and fellow supporters resisted, and she went on to finish the race. Switzer's effort motivated other women to take on marathon running, and the participation rose, although slowly. It was not until 1984 that the women's marathon was included in the Olympic program. Today, major city marathons in Boston, New York, London, Berlin, and cities around the world make the race one of the most attractive participatory and spectator amateur sports events in the world. National Football League 
The NFL, National Football League, is one of the wealthiest and most powerful sports organizations in the world. Many of the single franchises or teams are worth 200 to 300 million dollars each. As such, each team should be thought of as a major corporation. American style football, of which the NFL maintains a complete monopoly over the elite professional ranks, has its roots in English rugby, which was played in U.S. Eastern colleges and universities in the 19th century. However, rugby did not have features in keeping with American cultural norms. So U.S. football aroused out of norms consistent with American society, such as clearly measured possession of territory and the expansion of frontiers through conquering new land. Walter Camp, a Yale player, devised the rules of the American game. In 1880, he introduced downs into the game, or breaks, so that teams could reassess their position and prepare for the next attack. This was in stark contrast to rugby's non-stop and more flowing play. This move would years later be crucial to the sport's success. With natural breaks in play, the game would be one conducive to American commercial television, which relies on advertisement. Breaks for the generation of revenue. Equally important was the later inclusion of the forward pass into the game. This made the game appear more offensive, and the famous hail mary long pass is to this day one of the most dramatic plays in sport. Football's success as a dominant American sport, alongside baseball, was secured in the 1960s with some important contracts with television networks. The ABC Television Network sponsored a rival American Football League to compete with the other dominant National Football League. ABC Television did not hide the fact that the rival league was created for the sole purpose of creating more leverage with advertisers. After gaining greater legitimacy and earning more revenue, the upstart. Start AFL was able to negotiate independently with other television networks and sign on big name players. The most notable was star quarterback Joe Namath. With the AFL rising as a legitimate business competitor, the NFL and AFL negotiated a merger, resulting in the NFL League, as it is known to this day. Since the merger, the NFL has maintained almost a complete monopoly over American professional football. Football success then has been a reflection of the ideals of American society and, more specifically, of American-style commercial enterprise. The league's Success has, in no small part, been due to the relationship between the media and the sport. In a sense, football is a perfect example of a modern media-generated sport, successfully linking American norms and values with a sport tailor-made for commercial profit. Jackie Robinson. On April fifteenth, nineteen forty-seven, Jackie Robinson. 1919 to 1972, became the first African American to play in the Major League Baseball League. On that day, he started for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The so-called color line had existed in baseball and many other sports for decades in American sports. The complete segregation of whites and blacks into separate leagues and teams. There had been blacks in the sport of baseball for many years. In fact, in the 19th century, blacks had played alongside white players in several leagues in the U.S. However, an 1896 court case reinforced the segregation of baseball players according to the color of their skin. As a result, black players were excluded from Major League Baseball, relegated either to the position of mascot for the Major League team, or forced to organize their own loosely structured Negro teams. Robinson, the son of a sharecropper and grandson of a slave, excelled in several sports before serving in the U.S. Army. Initially a player in the Negro leagues, Robinson played in a period when there was increasing support for breaking down the color barrier. The Brooklyn Dodgers manager took on Robinson mainly because Robinson was a solid player, not because he was interested in challenging the color barrier. Also, he felt it would increase attendance at the Brooklyn games, especially of African American fans. In 1946, Robinson went to Florida to play for the Montreal Royals, the Dodgers' farm team. This move was risky on Robinson's part, as racism was still rampant in the U.S., especially in the South. 
In Florida, there were segregation laws that prohibited blacks and whites from sharing the same restaurants, hotels, and other public places, including the baseball field. Robinson was forced to stay in a coloreds-only hotel. It was believed that there would be a greater chance of Robinson being integrated into the minor league in the more liberal and open environment of Canada. Eventually, Robinson played his way into the major league. However, the transition was not a smooth one. In the first year, he had many pitches thrown his way and was regularly taunted by fans and players. However, his season was a successful one, and he was voted Rookie of the Year. Robinson's major league career lasted ten years. Despite his initial success in breaking the color line in baseball, it would take many decades before there would be complete acceptance of black players. To this day, there is underrepresentation of blacks in management and coaching positions in baseball. Robinson died in 1972. His headstone bears an epitaph that he wrote: "A life is not important except in the impact that it has on other lives." Title IV. In 1972, the United States Congress passed Title IV of the Educational Amendments. This instituted a law that would seriously affect all U.S. educational institutions' sports programs. The law specified that it was unlawful to discriminate on the basis of sex in any federally funded educational program. This meant, among other things, that boys and girls and men's and women's sports programs would have to receive equal funding and support under the new law. The law was passed in a time when feminist-inspired movements in many countries around the world were fighting for equality for women. While Title IV was a law directed at equality in education in general, it is sports programs that received the most attention. This was perhaps because of the visibility of sports and the prominent place they play, especially in American post-secondary education. Initially, Title IV met with mixed reviews. Especially vocal in opposition to the law were those who had a lot invested in men's sports programs and the bigger educational institutions. Also, those that had administered male sports programs for years felt that the changes necessary to conform to Title IV's standards would be difficult and expensive. In the aftermath of Title IV, a battle emerged between the National Collegiate Athletic Association (NCAA) and a group that had administered women's sports, the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Girls and Women, or AIAW. The NCAA had avoided equalization for years, being devoted almost exclusively to men's sport. In fact, it was in opposition to the NCAA that the AIAW formed in the first place. However, with federal funding now legally devoted to equalization, the NCAA made an about turn and suddenly supported equalization. In what many consider to be an obvious and unfortunate power move, the NCAA absorbed the AIAW. The long-term effects of this move were to wrestle control of women's sport out of the hands of women. The AIAW was administered by women for women. However, with the takeover, the administration of women's sport fell into the hands of men. Title IV did not manage to equalize funding between the sexes, at least not at first. The legislators of Title IV probably couldn't imagine the resistance to equalization in sport that would emerge, nor did they probably realize the extent of male privilege in school sport, especially at the upper, more elite levels. Almost 30 years after the legislation, there is still not equalization in many cases, although an increasing number of schools have fallen in line with the law. Today, women's sport has achieved a much higher level of respectability and support in schools. However, there is still resistance to complete equalization, and female supportive administrators continue to fight legal battles in support of girls and women's participation in sport. O.J. Simpson. It has been argued that the trial of Orenthal James O.J. Simpson for murder was the defining cultural experience of the U.S. in the 1990s. 
It dominated the front pages of newspapers in the U.S. and many other countries for several months. Indeed, Simpson was for a period of time probably the most talked about person in the world, but very few of the discussions were about his athletic career. Until his internationally famous trial, Simpson was a relative unknown outside the U.S. A very wealthy and highly decorated former professional football player, Simpson made the transition to acting and television commentating after his illustrious football career. However, when he was charged in June of 1994 with the murder of his estranged wife Nicole Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman, and after his dramatic suicide getaway attempt captured by television cameras, Simpson. Became known throughout the world almost overnight. Simpson was born in San Francisco in 1947 to a poor family. His father abandoned the family, and it was his mother who encouraged Simpson to pursue sport, mainly to compensate for some physical problems he had developed as a child. Simpson became a solid baseball and football player early in his life, and went on to enroll in the City College of San Francisco, where he continued to play impressive football. With offers from over 50 other universities to play football, Simpson went to the University of Southern California. There, he played out a distinguished college career and earned himself the 1968 Heisman Trophy for a top college player in the U.S. Simpson began his professional career by dropping out of school before graduation and immediately signed a three-year endorsement deal with Chevrolet for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Drafted by the Buffalo Bills in 1969, the first few years of Simpson's professional career were undistinguished ones. However, from 1972 on, a new coach for the team made Simpson the central figure in the team's offense. As a result, Simpson would go on to shatter several running records in the National Football League. At the conclusion of his career, Simpson was inducted into the Professional Football Players Hall of Fame. After his professional football career, stories about Simpson's alleged abuse of his wife began circulating. Nicole Simpson made the first call to police after an incident at a 1989 New Year's Eve party in which Simpson was fined two hundred dollars. Over the next few years, Nicole would make 30 emergency calls to police, none of which led to formal charges. After the incidents surrounding Nicole's death and Simpson's subsequent flight from police, an exhaustive months-long trial ensued, leading to Simpson's famous acquittal. More than just a murder trial, however, O.J. Simpson's trial highlighted the racial tensions in the U.S. In fact. History will undoubtedly remember Simpson more for his trial than for his illustrious football career. Fosbury flop. American athlete Dick Fosbury devised the high jump technique known as the Fosbury flop. His new technique revolutionized one of the oldest events in track and field competition. While Fosbury never broke the world record using his new technique, other high jumpers were inspired by his gold medal at the 1968 Summer Olympic Games in Mexico City, where he introduced his new jumping technique. Fosbury was born in 1946 in Oregon and went to Oregon State University. He won the gold medal in the Olympic Games at the very young age of 21. It was assumed that his odd-looking new method for clearing the bar was based on a careful study of the physics and biomechanics of high jump technique. However, Fosbury claimed it was the product of pure intuition. Prior to Fosbury's invention, most high jumpers used a straddle technique. In this older style of jumping, the front leg led the jumper up and over the bar in a face-down position. Fosbury's technique involves approaching the bar in a curve with a last-second acceleration. Then, at the point of takeoff, the body rotates, positioning the back to the bar and leaping backwards. The head faces the sky as the body arches over the bar, with the mid-body and legs trailing behind. Fosbury had begun experimenting with the new technique when he was only 16 years old. In a meet in 1968, in which Fosbury used the new technique, a local newspaper's headline read, "Fosbury flops over the bar." 
Thus, the name of a newly invented technique was born. Since Fosbury's competitive days, his technique has been widely copied. Once experienced jumpers mastered the technique, records started to fall in the sport, due mostly to the Fosbury flop, but also to better equipment and running surfaces. Dick Fosbury will always be known for his revolutionizing of the sport of high jump. Free agency. Free agency refers to the ability of athletes to negotiate their own contracts and working conditions in professional sport. Before the 1970s, most professional sports had some sort of reserve system for athletes. In their reserve systems, players were forced to play for a single team, usually for the duration of their careers, under the conditions set by the team owner and the league bosses. Historically, the sport of baseball had the most notorious reserve system, which had been intact and strictly enforced for decades. The purpose of the reserve system was to allow owners of professional teams to control the movement of players and reduce their salaries. By being forced to play for only one team, players had little choice but to accept the contractual terms and conditions set out for the player. The player, in short, did not have the freedom to offer and negotiate his services on the open market, as is done on all other industries. This significantly reduced owners' payroll expenses and increased profits greatly. In North America, the major professional leagues in the sports of baseball, football, hockey, and basketball all had some form of reserve system. In the late 1960s and 1970s, however, the reserve system encountered a number of challenges. The most important challenge came from a baseball player, Kurt Flood of the St. Louis Cardinals. Flood refused the terms of a trade and offered his services on the open market of the Major League Baseball. When no offers were made, Flood filed suit in American courts under the Sherman Antitrust Act, which makes it unlawful for any business or combination of businesses to maintain a monopoly in any commercial industry. While Flood did not win the case, a series of subsequent legal decisions made it apparent that baseball owners had unreasonable control over their laborers, the players. The baseball players' union became more militant as a result of the flood case. In 1976, a court decision granted players free agency and the right to negotiate the conditions of their labor services much more freely than they had in the past. The move to free agency changed the character of the relations between professional sports clubs and their owners. Previously, owners worked or colluded together to limit the movement of players. Professional sports clubs acted like a well-organized club. Free agency meant a more competitive environment for players, and of course, players' salaries have risen substantially as a result. Today, sports fans often complain that players' salaries are too high. While certainly at times it seems difficult to justify the huge salaries of today, it should be kept in mind that before the current era of free agency and big contracts, players barely made a subsistence wage and often worked under conditions of servitude. The situation now might be less than perfect. However, it's certainly a vast improvement over the pre-free agency days. New Zealand. New Zealand is a country that is located in the South Pacific Ocean. The country is made up of two large islands, the North Island and the South Island, which are separated by a narrow channel of water. Although New Zealand has many beautiful mountains and forests, much of the land is used for farming. In fact, New Zealand has almost 70 million sheep, but only four million people. New Zealand's farms are also famous for their delicious fruit, especially apples and kiwi fruit. About 10 percent of the people who live in New Zealand belong to an ethnic group. Called the Maori, the Maori came to New Zealand by boats from small Polynesian islands. They arrived about a thousand years ago, and lived by farming, hunting, and fishing. About two hundred years ago, many more people came to New Zealand. 
These people were from the British Isles, and they came to New Zealand to begin farms. Today, most of the people of New Zealand are descended from people who came from Britain. During the 19th century, some wars started between the Maori and the British settlers. After years of fighting, the two sides signed a treaty to end the wars. Today, the Maori have achieved equal rights, but there are still some disagreements about land ownership. In recent years, many more people have come to New Zealand, mostly from Asian countries and from other Pacific islands. There are three large cities in New Zealand. Auckland is the largest city, with more than one million people. It is located in the northern part of North Island. The capital city of New Zealand is Wellington. It is located in the southern part of the North Island. The largest city of the South Island is Christchurch. The cities of New Zealand are very modern and clean. Many tourists enjoy visiting the cities of New Zealand, but they also enjoy the beautiful countryside. New Zealand is an excellent place for outdoor recreation, such as climbing or walking. Most of New Zealand has a mild or temperate climate. The summer is not very hot, and the winter is not very cold. Because New Zealand is in the southern part of the world, summer begins in December, and winter begins in June. The South Island is cooler than the North Island, but both islands have similar amounts of rain. This rain gives the fields and forests of New Zealand a beautiful green color. Each year, many tourists visit New Zealand to experience the beautiful countryside. And the interesting cultures of its people. Track and field. In many parts of the world, the sport of track and field is very popular. Actually, the sport of track and field includes many different sports. In some of these sports, the athletes run on a track. The athletes race against each other to find out who can run the fastest. Some of these track events require great speed for a short distance. In the hundred meter race, the athletes must sprint as quickly as possible. Some athletes can run a hundred meters in only ten seconds. Other track races are much longer, and these events require great endurance. In the marathon, the athletes must run a distance of forty-two kilometers. Because this is such a long distance, the athletes cannot run too quickly at the start. Instead, it is important to run at a steady pace and keep some energy for the end of the race. Some athletes can run the marathon in little more than two hours. Some races are called middle distance races because the distance is not very short, yet is also not very long. For example, the 1500 meter requires a mixture of speed and endurance. Some athletes can run the 1500 meters in less than four minutes. There are also some track events for people who use a wheelchair. Wheelchair athletes can race even faster than athletes who run. Some of the races on the track are for teams of four runners. Each athlete carries a small stick called a baton. After running a certain distance, the runner must hand the baton to a teammate, who then runs with the baton. To win this race, the team's runners must be very fast, but they must also cooperate very well with each other. In the field events, athletes compete by jumping or throwing. In the long jump, the athletes run up to a line, and then try to jump as far forward as possible. In the high jump, the athletes must try to jump over a very high bar. Another field event is called the shot put. In this event, 
the athletes try to throw a heavy metal ball as far as possible. Yet another field event is called the javelin throw. In this event, the athletes try to throw a long spear as far as possible. Athletes who compete in the throwing events must be very strong. Both men and women compete in the sport of track and field. Many boys and girls enjoy track and field as part of their education in school. Those boys and girls who have much talent and who work very hard might someday compete in the Olympics. But for most people, track and field is just a fun and healthy way to get exercise and to make friends. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was one of the most famous inventors of all time. He was born in a small town in the United States during the year 1847. When he was a young boy, Thomas found school to be very boring. A teacher once told Thomas's mother that he believed the young boy was rather stupid. However, Edison's mother knew better. She understood that her son was very intelligent. She then took him away from school and began to teach him herself. As a young man, Thomas Edison became very interested in inventing new machines. One of his first inventions was a small electrical machine that could be used for counting votes. However, the government was not interested in his invention. But Edison was not discouraged. He continued inventing. And his next invention was an electrical machine that could be used for recording the prices of stock. This invention was very popular and successful. Probably the most famous invention of Edison is the electric light bulb. Before Edison, there had been some electric lights, but these were very expensive. In 1879, Edison invented a new kind of light bulb. That could shine for a long time. Within a few years, Edison's electric lights were used on the streets of cities in many countries. Soon after, people began using electric lights in their homes. Another invention of Edison's is no longer used today. That invention was called the phonograph. It was a machine that could be used to record sounds. Such as music and conversation. When Edison invented this machine in 1877, it was the first time that anyone had been able to preserve sounds. Today, people do not use the phonograph anymore. Instead, they use compact discs or CDs to record music and other sounds. Edison also helped to improve some inventions that already existed. For example. He made improvements to the telephone and to the cameras that are used in making movies. However, Edison is most famous for his inventions, such as the light bulb and the phonograph. Edison lived to an old age, and he died in 1931. Although Edison was an extremely creative man, he believed that his success was due to many hours of hard work. He once said that. Genius is one percent inspiration and ninety-nine percent perspiration. In other words, a successful person should have good ideas, but the most important thing is to work very hard.